So I'm going to start from the catalog questions. Um, uh, first, we had a comment uh, in the chat box about um, the influence of migratory fowl, uh, wild birds. Um, and right away, uh, a nice publication was also ch uh, shared. So obviously, this is uh, one of the biggest concerns with um, another outbreak or essentially um, version two of the 2015 outbreak um, along migratory flyways. So there are a variety of BMPs. Uh, recommended by government agencies. There are um, actual rules and contracts within some of the integrators in the poultry industry. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, this, this issue is, is being looked at and could be a webinar on its own. Um, there's also a lot of... Actually, let me pause a minute. Josh or Jean, did you want to uh, make any comment on that? Um, it's not exactly a composting question, but in the context of the outbreak, it's quite important. I, I think you covered it. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of discussion about um, implementation of foaming and, and safety and how those contractors were acting and behaving. Um, and as several yeah. people replied, you know, that was often uh, the prerogative of that company. But, um, Gene, maybe I'll let you jump in there real quick and sure. That. Um, the, comp the, the composters aren't always involved in, in the depop. In one of the cases I was in, I was involved in the depop because we didn't have any birds to work with. So we weren't building compost piles and we needed to, to get things done. Um, we were all, had everybody had PPE on that was anywhere near it. The people that you saw in the foam they had total breathing equipment on, and if they went down, they still could breathe. Um, so in that way, it wasn't an effect. It's a dangerous process. There's no doubt about it. Um, and people do slip, and things can happen. We also worked very um, diligently with the buddy system so that you were keeping track of somebody else um, at the same time. So if somebody disappeared, you, could, you'd be, you were right there. Great. Thanks for, for following up on that. Um, there's also a bit of discussion going on, and I combined a couple questions from two different times, um, about ventilation. And um, this was actually a particular concern of mine during my brief deployment to Minnesota. Um, we were walking through some houses with a producer, just sort of verifying quality control on the monitoring process. So taking temperatures along those windrows, um, about 10 different sites along the length of those windrows. So uh, we are in a situation where the houses were, were buttoned down and um, we cracked the curtains um, and, and let the houses start to ventilate for about 20 minutes or so before going in to do that um, daily monitoring exercise. So we got some help just going in sequence and venting those houses. Um, prior to that venting, it was a wall, a blast um, of ammonia primarily and, and other gases. Um, some other discussion on the Wednesday morning conference calls that the APHIS-led um, team of experts were having all summer um, was that keeping the houses buttoned down uh, was not choking off um, airflow or productivity to the compost piles. So no actual gas measurements were made, no actual studies done, but that was an anecdotal opinion. So real quick with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Josh or Gene if they want to comment on that. We Certainly opening the house up is paramount. Uh, we would have a, I could see a sign placed on the door, no work or uh, entry until uh, the houses have been uh, ventilated. So so that was an issue. The rest of the time, we, we pretty much kept the houses closed. I mean, these were curtain-sided houses, and we seemed to have enough airflow for the composting during that process. Uh, the one question was during turning, did, how much ventilation did we have? Well, we would essentially uh, open up the, the houses to ventilate them and, and then, uh, you know, when you do turn the pile, you, you would have some ammonia release. That's natural. Uh, so you certainly want to have enough uh, 
ventilation in there during that turning process because there will be some ammonia released. All right, thanks, Josh. Um, I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. Um, I was in Minnesota near the end of um, the last few positives, um, and the question is regarding carbon material. So at that time of the response in southwestern Minnesota, um, the discussions were starting about uh, about carbon sources. Um, driving around to do site visits, uh, I was still seeing landscape companies that had decent carbon. Um, one of the uh, laying operations I worked with actually brought a chipper shredder on site and um, they went ahead and started pruning the windbreak that was part of the farm, if you can imagine a Midwestern prairie windbreak around the farmstead. Um, they, <laughs> they started pruning that and taking care of dead stuff in there to capture that carbon. Um, Josh is weighing in that uh, they didn't have that issue in Iowa. I will say that some of the integrators or, or poultry companies were concerned that um, all the carbon would be consumed in the response and that there wouldn't be quality carbon for repopulation for rebuilding litter in the houses. So. Um, I think the kind of, we kind of missed that as an issue that would have shut things down, but people were certainly considering it. Yeah, I have a comment about that. Um, one of the, I think, the disconnects in general between in, in communities and these communities were responding well. They, the fire department was willing to do whatever they needed to. The, you know, all different groups were stepping up and saying, "I can help." Um, but there's a disconnect between solid waste people that manage solid waste and farms. And the people that manage solid waste have the wood chips. <laughs> that all of it gets brought to them, they chip it up, and generally it's easy. It's it's you know some places have more trees than others, but generally they'll know where some of the wood chips are and where where they can be moved from. So I think remembering to make that that um, you know they may not even know the solid waste people may not even know that there's an outbreak. In on the farms, they may not be tuned into that. So you know, making sure that they that the farmers know that solid waste groups generally have chips is helpful. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, I wanted to encompass a couple different questions in the, one of the last discussions in the uh, chat room, and that was issues of um, pest abatement, uh, rodents, uh, flies. Et cetera, and the success of any um, baiting treatments or fogs. Um, I don't have anything to say on that personally. Josh or Gene, did you experience um, any issues around that? I, I experienced issues with, with flies, but keep in mind, uh, we were behind the eight ball on, on uh, the turkey operations. We uh, arrived on the scene after the depop crews had left. Um, all the equipment and labor had been sent to the layer operations at the time. And once the turkey operations broke, uh, we didn't have those resources. So that's part of the reason why you saw carcasses that were left uh, in a house abandoned for anywhere up to you know a few days to uh, two weeks. And uh, if you're going to have carcasses uncovered for that amount of time, you're gonna have significant odor and fly populations. So if you can get to them in time and get them composted immediately and have a fine material that you use to cap it, I think you can uh, uh, reduce significantly the risk of, of uh, having fly problems. Uh, yeah. But in this particular case, we weren't able to do that and uh, we had fly populations. So the question became, how do we control those fly populations? And that's a good question for um, that we. That's a lesson learned. Uh, how are we going to respond next time if we don't get there soon enough uh, to excessive fly populations? Mm -hmm. I think that that's that's part of timing. Um, yeah, we're gonna at some point we're gonna have fly issues and things like that. But if things can be timed a little bit better, which I'm not sure that they can be always, because 
there are, I think there are five foaming groups in the country that are subcontracted through APHIS, and there are others that do other things, but there are not always enough people around to to coordinate the killing and the, the depopulation and the disposal stuff. So as, you know, my suggestion is as much as possible, I think, with education getting out there so that more people will be able to start the compost process, um, that's going to help with our fly problems. We just need to have more education out there and, and get more people um, knowing what to do right away. So it uh, looks like some folks are attacking um, a couple other questions here in the chat room, which is great, because um, I'd like to get to a couple more items, and then um, we can revisit this pest thing, particularly with the rodents, which we haven't explicitly um, commented on. And with these abatement strategies, I, you know, <laughs> I reckon they're about as successful as they ever are. And you can walk into barns of all different species, and there's going to be a certain amount of flies. Um, and those abatement strategies or products, you know don't work as well as addressing the root cause, spill feed and, and other issues like that. So I think the same sort of scenario applies. Um, one question is regarding um, clearing up the, uh, well, just reiterating and stating the kill temperatures, uh, the, the target temperatures for virus inactivation and time that uh, is also incorporated into the protocol that uh, Josh referenced. So. Um, Josh, would you like to speak to that directly, please? Um, yeah, one 131 Fahrenheit or 55 Celsius for three days it was our target <clears throat> for pathogen kill, and, and we're using uh, EPA standards as, as a base for this. So we felt that if we could achieve those temperatures, we were effectively inactivating the virus. Yeah. And Thank you. as I mentioned, uh, the compost piles I was involved in from the beginning to the end, uh, no issues whatsoever. In fact, we exceeded that temperature. Most of my, most of the piles were around 140 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also don't want those temperatures to go up too much higher just because of spontaneous combustion. So we want that 131 to 160 max, and then then water has to be added or something. You know, yeah. we've got to get those piles cooler because 170, 180, um, we're liable to have spontaneous combustion. So. Um, Anne, I didn't want to disregard your question about, um, it's more of an epidemiological question about uh, AI and wild birds and risks to, um, to wild populations. And I just don't feel that uh, anybody right now uh, it's appropriate to speak to that, so um, did see that, but I am going to move on. I just don't feel comfortable. Um, let's see. Uh, as we are also um, approaching the time available to us for the whole event, um, I'll wrap up with a question about any special machine uh, machines or compost turning equipment um, of our three folks here today, I'll say I didn't observe it, the use of anything other than um, skid steers and some specialized in-barn tractors. Josh, Gene, what was your experience? Yeah, um, bobcats, loaders um, seemed to work well, and the farmers had really good access to, if they didn't have it on farm already, they were able to get it in, and I think Josh had said something very appropriate that the farmers... Um, the farmers are very good at using that equipment, and so they are the most efficient at, at actually doing that. Mm -hmm. there, um, there was a, a, a turner that was used on a layer operation, and I'm, I'm just referring to Mark Hutchinson's experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the only one to my knowledge, but the, uh, the skid steers, for what we were doing, worked just fine. I think if you get to layer operations and you're doing outdoor composting and you have miles and miles of windrows, then uh, compost turning equipment uh, could be looked into. But for in-house yeah. composting and what we were doing, I think the most appropriate is a mid-sized skid steer. 
maybe some payloaders and, to help move large material. And just in case we did not get this across, um, turning isn't a regular part of the operation. Um, these are static windrows generally, so the, the piles are going to heat up, and if we build the piles correctly with good carbon sources so that the air can get into those piles, the temperatures will stay up, and we won't have to turn. And we really, in the protocols, I think we're not turning until um, 14 days as long as we've reached the, the temperatures that we want. Um, so it's between 14 and 21 days that those piles are even touched or turned or anything like that. So we really want to minimize the amount of turning that we do. Uh, a windrow turner works, would work very well later on in the process um, to keep those piles going after they're moved out of the houses. Um, we have a question here about, um, well, I lost the spontaneous combustion and moving into stipulation of the materials afterwards. Um, in Minnesota, uh, the decision was made if um, the composting team manager or the subject matter experts in that team um, signed the release letter based on the benchmark temperatures and times, then the, uh, the final disposition of that material would then fall under the state regulatory agency that does, that already deals with manure and compost and land application. Um, but that's what happened in Minnesota. Uh, Josh, Jean, I don't know if there are any other um, scenarios regarding the final use of that uh, material. I think it just follows state regulations and is treated as manure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, yeah. the CAFO the CAFO rules, um, because at that point you're a CAFO and we've got to be applying the manure and the compost at those rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just moved it to those um, authorities, state or even local, that were looking at nutrient management issues and uh, FOCAFRO rules in the state. 